Kate Sith Ketchy from Final Fantasy VII is entirely forgettable as a character. He's not fun to play as a party member. It took less than five minutes of gameplay and more than 27 hours of him being in my party by force to inform this opinion. An impression was left that felt irreversible. That was until about two weeks ago when the latest Final Fantasy VII Rebirth footage came out. And in just 10 seconds, the amount of time we get to see Kate Sith in the upcoming title, my opinion of him turned a full 180 degrees from apathy to excitement. Let me provide some context. If you were asked, who is your least favorite Final Fantasy VII character? This guy is almost certainly a shoe in even when you compare him to the less desirables of other Final Fantasy games, excluding Crybaby Hope, of course, he's near the least. Yes, Amaranth is better than him. Amaranth sucks. That should tell you something. Heck, even his job class is terrible. He's a gambler? Not a fun job class, by the way. No, I don't want to play slots to determine the outcome of my attack. Gambling is only exciting in real life and Dragon Quest. Gambling is only fun if your character's name is Waka. Suffice to say, this guy's chock full of mishaps, and he doesn't have an airship to make up for it. There's a lot of controversy surrounding this party member, starting with his name. What are we supposed to call this guy? Is it Kate Sith or Ketchy? The Gaelic pronunciation and lore suggests that his name is Ketchy. The Scottish accent we heard in the recent trailer leads me to believe that this guy will be calling himself Ketchy. But my upbringing tells me he's Kate Sith. The majority of internet forums say his name is Kate Sith. Most importantly, my heart tells me he's Kate Sith. And you know what they say about Siths. They deal in absolutes. But the Kate Sith from Final Fantasy VII isn't just dealing in absolutes. He's absolutely terrible. Failure. The only reason I know that Kate Sith makes it to the end of Final Fantasy VII is because the intro of Advent Children told me he was there. That's how little I remember this jabroni. In Final Fantasy VII, there are optional characters with way better aesthetics, way cooler attacks at their disposal, and way more enriching backstories than this dude. Let's focus on those backstories for a moment. The ninja Yuffie is from the war-torn nation, now a tourist trap, of Wu Tai. She decided to flee, partaking in a solo operation to steal the materia needed to restore the freedom of her people lost from subjugation to Shinra. And then there's Vincent Valentine, the crestfallen former member of the Turks, whose backstory deals with a love triangle involving Professor Hojo and Lucretia, the mother of Sephiroth. Not only was Vincent betrayed and shot by Hojo, his corpse was also experimented on, which causes him to transform into the monsters that we see during his limit breaks. Now those are backstories. And what do we get for Kate Sith? He's controlled by Reeve? You know, the head of Shinra's urban development sector? Not exactly riveting. There's an even way cooler cat in Final Fantasy VII, in the flavor of Red XIII, who's also known as Nanaki, because, you guessed it, he had a way cooler backstory. Red XIII also has utility on the battlefield, and when you compare the attacks and abilities of these two cats, Kate Sith can't help not looking like a discount. Back to these two. The fact that I want to play characters, who I went out of my way to acquire for my party, and even further out of my way to learn their backstories and gain their final limit breaks over a character who is mandatorily in the party and who I only used one time in the entire game when the situation called for it, should tell you as much as you need to know about this goober smooch. Outside of two scenes which I'll mention later, Kate Sith's best contribution to the party is his occasional silence. His character feels like it was written as a plot device, voiding out any utility as a functional party member. Did you know that he's the third best magic user in the game? Or that he has some of the most available materia slots for his weapons out of all of the party members? Yeah, me neither. Kate Sith, he's a powerful mage, I guess. Asking me to remember details about Kate Sith is like asking me to remember an ex I don't miss. Oh wait, I liked that ex at one point in time. Asking me to remember things about Kate Sith is like asking me about that one kid from school who only hung out with you at school. Do you remember Greg? From third grade? No, I don't remember Greg. Greg was entirely forgettable. Is his name even Greg? I haven't spoken about Kate Sith's control method yet, but we can touch on that briefly. How is Kate Sith controlled? And who controls the lumpy pink guy he's riding? Per the game manual, Kate Sith can summon a Mog doll which I'm going to assume is a Moogle and not a rejected band member from Chuck E. Cheese, with magic. And if you read or managed to translate the Ultimania Mega entry for Reeve, you can discover that Shinra's head of urban development controls the stuffed feline with an ability called Inspire. So Reeve can literally breathe life into Kate Sith and control him, or be hands off like we see several times in the game. 
This clears up some confusion, as it can be hard to discern just who you're talking to at times. Like, seriously, did this goofy stuffed animal just relate to me about philosophy? It is relieving to know that magic is what does all of this, because I have a hard time believing that a radio signal is able to reach Kate Sith in hard to reach places, like the bottom of the ocean or inside the northern crater. One more concept I would like to touch on is the subject of Moogles. Moogles come in several varieties. They started as Hummingways and briefly died as Moombas, which are species that appear more aligned with the standard Moogle look rather than a paradox Pokemon ancestor you might stumble upon wandering around the world map of Chrono Trigger's 65 million BC. Moogles come back with a vengeance in Final Fantasy IX in such a pronounced way that no other entry has been able to hold a candle to. We have to give a special mention to Nectar the Bold for attempting to recapture Moogles' former glory, because even that's better than Final Fantasy VII's adulterated Mogdal. Nectar is a character who only assigns hunts and engages in banter, and yet he provides more value than this goofball. Moogles are silly and cute little magical creatures. They've become a mascot for the series alongside Chocobos. Moogles tend to perform great feats in Final Fantasy. Mog from Final Fantasy VI was the leader of the Moogles who learned the language of humans from Rama the Esper. He could wield a variety of weapons and had abilities catered to a hybridized dancer geomancer job class. Stiltskin from Final Fantasy IX had a neat world-spanning side quest that involved delivering letters to other Moogles around the planet of Gaia. He gave a reason for the player to find every save point, to enjoy a peaceful rest in the corner of a dark dungeon, and to continue to learn about the characters and events of the world provided by his missives. In the same game, Aiko has her endearing Moogle friend, who's also named Mog. Mog is Aiko's guardian who overcomes her timid nature when it counts by making the ultimate sacrifice to protect the party, leaving the ribbon item in her wake, which is an item that can resist most elemental statuses and prevent any status ailment. It's one of my go-to headgear items in any Final Fantasy. The Moogles of Final Fantasy IX are hard examples to compare to, but they serve as an example of how great Moogles can be. The Moogles of FF9 feel like they were made in response to the terrible precedent that Kate Sith set for the 3D Moogle back in Final Fantasy VII. Because Moogles only tend to be great, we have this Gibraltar. He's a dopey antithesis to the idea of the Moogle. Final Fantasy VII knows what a Moogle looks like. The game features a Moogle summon and the Golden Saucer minigame, Mog's House. Like, come on, you know what a Moogle is supposed to look like. Despite knowing the appearance of a Moogle, we get this diluted neckbeard that's trying to bring soul patches and fedoras back, which is, quite frankly, only something Kazuma Kiryu can do. I'm aware of the graphical limitations of the time, but again, the dev team knew how Moogles were supposed to look. Kirby eating a car can pull off the disproportionately obtuse look. This guy looks like he ate the remade version of Wedge, metabolic syndrome and all, scaled down to Lara Croft PlayStation 1 fidelity, and was banished to the island of misfit toys. In terms of the meaningful actions apropos of Moogles, it's easy to overlook what Kate Sith and his Mog doll did. I said earlier that the pair seemed more like a plot device than a functional party member. This is demonstrated when Kate Sith makes the seemingly ultimate sacrifice in the Temple of Ancients in order for the main party to retrieve the Black Materia. Kate Sith has this heartfelt monologue about how there's plenty of stuffed toys like my body around, but there's only one me. It's very Kingdom Hearts. And it gives the player an emotional gut check. This character is writing his wrong of betraying the party. He's giving up his existence so that the gang can thwart Sephiroth's plan to destroy the world by obtaining the Black Materia. But it's impossible to feel the gravitas of that action because Kate Sith just derps himself back into the fold, not even five minutes after being imploded. Given how Kate Sith betrayed the party by giving the Keystone to the Turks, how he captured Marlene, and how lackluster his presence on the team is, this feels cheap. In hindsight, I would have changed his name to MacGuffin after meeting him. This is the part where I tell you that Kate Sith's low bar plot devising is misunderstood. That meaningless death was frustrating to watch, no doubt about it, but it served an underlying purpose. At the time, Final Fantasy VII was tasked with following up, depending on how you look at it, roughly 15 to 20 sacrifices, 11 of which were in Final Fantasies II and IV alone. It was a trope to have a main or side character selflessly offer themselves up to save the world. In 1997, if you had the terms final and fantasy on your game box art. So in order to impact you with this, you had to be distracted by this. It was a red herring meant to throw you off the scent of what was to come. And when you see this goofy pair die and then come back, it's meant to trick you into thinking that everyone is all right. All will be well. Everyone's going to make it and we're going to have a happy end.
Everything will not be all right. The game's most happy-go-lucky, fill-you-with-hope character turns into ashes without so much as a farewell. There's zero closure and little to zero optimism after Aerith's death because of Kate Sith's fake-out. Kate Sith died so that Aerith could die for real. I know that a lot of people didn't have Kate Sith in their party when Aerith died, but he has one of the most profound moments in the game if you choose to keep him in your party during the game's darkest hour. And in a way, this redeems his entire hot garbage arc and lackluster playstyle. This moment appears confusing. If you have Kate Sith in your party after the Genova life boss battle, he does this odd little dance in front of our lifeless heroine. At first glance, this looks like a slight. I mean, who dances in front of, in a lot of people's opinions, the best girl after her non-Phoenix Down refundable death? Kate Sith then shimmies away sheepishly. You have to remember that this is 1997, and character animation quality is limited. This dance, which, on the surface, feels out of place and inappropriate, is actually the same dance Kate Sith performs when Cloud first meets him. It's the animation for a dance the goofy pair does when they're reading someone's fortune. And the prerequisite for that fortune is that the target has to have a future in order for it to work. If the fortune works, the Mog doll performs an animation of dispensing and handing out a fortune. This doesn't happen for Aerith because she's gone. It's this moment of sobering finality that gives Kate Sith profound redemption, inverse to his tchotchke presence in the game. These are the opinions of my time spent with the original Kate Sith. But two weeks ago, that all changed. In the latest Rebirth trailer, we only get 10 seconds of footage featuring Kate Sith, and that short amount of time makes up for over 25 years worth of disappointment. As more of a side note, I think it's fair to say that a character like Kate Sith can fall back in favor just as quickly as he can fall out of it. Now, we're going to be playing new characters in Rebirth, and we know that neither Vincent nor Sid will be playable. Yuffie was introduced at the end of Remake with the Intergrade DLC, and she was fun. Players are already familiar with her. Of course, everyone is going to love playing as Sephiroth, who will probably be playable in more than one chapter, because Square Enix isn't going to just invest the time and resources into making him playable, only to let this happen during the Nibelheim flashback. That would be like making Red 13 playable during the last three hours of Remake. It would be a waste of development time. I've gotta say that I was excited for Red 13 before Remake was released. He was in my final party in the original game. He's busted in the old game. You're already aware of what was keeping me from ever touching Kate Sith in the original Final Fantasy VII, and somehow, I'm willing to abandon those preconceived notions. I'm now considering replacing Red 13 with Kate Sith this time around, which isn't something that I thought I would ever say. I think that Square Enix is going to do his character a much needed service by actually making him fun and engaging in Rebirth. It's evident to me that the dev team has something magical up their sleeves with Kate Seth. His premiere demonstrates that he can act less like a useless gambler and more like a trickster druid that summons a stuffed familiar, which is a changeup I was not expecting. I never thought I would be saying this, but I'm glad that Rebirth is keeping Kate Sith's classic look. I'm not sure what my expectations were for the Mogdal, outside of making him appear less paleolithic and less like he's had his fourth heart stent put in in an effort to make him more modern, but I'm glad that Creative Business Unit 1 doubled down on his plushy look. Seeing the Mogdal in the recent trailer just made things click for me. He's meant to look like a goober, and now he has the graphical fidelity to accommodate that appearance. As you can see, Kate Sith can act alone in addition to summoning the Mogdal, just like his original game manual description says. You can sense the authenticity of that dynamic, and the Mogdal doesn't feel like a hindrance to the pair. He feels like the star of the show. This is evident when Kate Sith summons the doll and the two start fighting like a professional wrestling tag team. Let's give this a breakdown. Kate Sith used to ride the Mogdal into a blatantly robotic one-trick Hulk smash. Now Kate Sith volleys an enemy into the ground, and then the Mog poofs in to curb stomp the enemy. Immediately following this, the doll does a ballet Sean spin into a belly slide uppercut. Let me repeat that. The Mog doll does a ballet Sean's spin into a belly slide uppercut. It feels like I'm watching Dan Hibiki wreck Ryu in Street Fighter. It feels like Kate Sith is going to be the two-man drunken Kung Fu Voltron partnership I didn't know I wanted. And it just gets even better. The only synergy attack we see involving Kate Sith is with Aerith. Aerith creates these magical orbs in her trademark pink color for the Mogdal, and the Mogdal gobbles all the orbs up, only to immediately vomit them back into the enemy forces, like a Kamehameha wave. This is the Kate Sith that Final Fantasy VII needed. This is the hero that Rebirth deserves. He's the goofy wildcard that the PlayStation 1 could never accommodate. 
He's unapologetic about who he is, and I'm sold. I can't wait to play him. And this short demonstration makes me confident that he will have a relevance to the story that many people didn't get to witness in 1997. I'm curious to hear your thoughts about this or any other Rebirth topic. Leave a comment and let's chat. This has been Wiz. I'm going to go catch some lightning. I'll see you in the next one.